You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I sit down with Matthew Pipenberg to learn about the market's risks and opportunities that lie ahead. Matthew is the co-founder of Signals Matter and co-author of the book Rig to Fail. He has over 20 years of experience in investing, alternative assets, and finance with expertise in managed futures, credit, and equity investing. Matthew is providing so much great information during our conversation that it ran a bit long and I decided to cut it into two episodes. So today's episode is part one of our conversation, and we'll finish the conversation in part two next week. But without further delay, let's dive into this thought-provoking conversation with Matthew Pipenberg. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I'm excited to have Matthew Pipenberg. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thanks, Robert. Good to be here. Let's start by talking about your background a little bit. Tell us how you got to where you are today. You know, I kind of am an accidental tourist in finance. I, I started as a, as a, right out of grad school as a young lawyer. And you know, my best friend then and now from high school and college was working in investment banking on the West Coast. And I was on the East Coast doing transactional securities law and real estate law. And that was at the, just the kind of nascent of the first tech bubble in the late 1990s. There was a raging NASDAQ and and it was the dot-com boom. And he had done exceptionally well as an investment banker. And I was kind of the modest lawyer and he had pooled together, you know, the the joke is friends, family, and fools, money from those groups. And we put together our first hedge fund during a time when, when markets were just really just incredibly powerfully strong. And it was the first of the three boom to bust cycles that I kind of experienced. I was in my 20s and we were very fortunate to be good friends and to trust each other and have some good investors. And we got very, very lucky on an IPO in a tech tech sector back in the late 90s. That was the the rage with these IPOs and pre-IPOs. And if you had relationships or a decent amount of money in your fund, you get into those. And so we were really more lucky than smart in our 20s. And our first fund really had a great couple of years. And, And that was a surreal experience. But it was my first experience in, in kind of coming out of the law firm. I hardly knew a stock from a bond. And we just kind of learned as we went along. But it was a, a really surreal experience just to see markets and that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of exaggerated valuations, and then that kind of bust afterwards by 2000, 2001. That same market that had given so much joy gave a lot of pain. And by 2003, the NASDAQ was down 80% from its highs. But I was very lucky really lucky, I think, just common sense. When I saw the market peaking so crazily, I was able to kind of be more defensive and take some of my, my earnings, so to speak, out of the market. But that was really where I started. You know, as a friendship with a fre- fellow I really trusted and, and enjoyed working with and left the law and, and really have been in finance ever since, doing different things. But once we had had that experience, we started investing our own money and other people's money and other funds and other funny things. We did a little dalliance in Hollywood and film production. And that was always crazy. But most of it was going back into family office work or hedge fund investing, creating a couple other hedge funds. But yeah, it was really just from my late 20s going to that first super bubble of the, you're young. But when I was, I was very young in 1999, 2000, it was just incredible time to, to luck into the markets. Everything was just going up and we kind of lucked out then. For those listening to the show today who have heard of hedge funds and family offices, but may not know exactly what they are, please explain what a hedge fund is, what a family office is, and how the two are different from each other. Great. I mean, hedge funds are kind of mythical. There's this thought, well, hedge funds are just vehicles that make lots of money and have rich guys running them, rich people running them, and rich people investing in them. And what really is a hedge fund? I mean, technically, as an entity, a hedge fund is a limited partnership that's at the discretion of its general partner or the portfolio manager. And that portfolio manager can be an individual or a team, but it's really a vehicle that pools together other people's money. And those other people are accredited investors, which means they have to have a minimum net worth of two to five million. So hedge funds are very exclusive just by their very legal nature to not be SEC 
registered, that they have to have this legal entity that allows only wealthy investors to be in them with the, the theory being that those wealthy investors are sophisticated and they can afford to take risk. And so the portfolio manager of that hedge fund really has tremendous discretion to invest in any kind of asset he or she wants, whether it's stocks or bonds or commodities, currencies, or a mixture of those, whether it's long or short, whether it's some kind of arbitrage or leverage strategy. Ideally, hedge funds, as the name suggests, hedge risk. In other words, they can go long go long by buying an asset or an index or a market and they can short it. That means bet against it. So they can theoretically ride that clutch and have some positions long and some positions short. So they're designed to not have lots of risk and then good return because ideally that portfolio manager who runs that hedge fund has some expertise and some inside skill or kind of advantage that they can outperform the stock market and certainly not have the same risk of the stock market. That's in an ideal situation. But again, like I said, there's the, the cinematic Gordon Gecko kind of Wall Street Raider type and the, you know, the Bobby Axelrod from Billions makes it look really fun. But there's about 14,000 hedge funds out there. And, and I'd say maybe 20% of them do better than the other 80%. And so the, there's a lot, of, a lot of real lemons. I've seen some, I've invested in some, I've been involved with some, some real lemons where you have these theoretically smart folks who think they know the markets, but really don't know how to trade the markets. It's a very different skill to have an opinion about the market, but then how to trade it is very different. So a hedge fund is kind of a myth, but there are some good ones and there's a lot of bad ones. And then you just kind of have to know how to do them. But they they basically invest in anything they kind of want. And that can even be private equity or real estate or non-public securities. A family office, to your other question, is there's two types where there's a single family office and a multifamily office. And typically what a family office is, it's, it's a family with tremendous wealth. And they usually have so much wealth that rather than just give all their money to Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or HSBC, they, they basically create their own office. They bring in a CIO and a general counsel and they bring in a bunch of analysts and they invest that family's generational wealth. And that they typically invest in lots of hedge funds and they'll invest in real estate and they'll invest in currencies and precious metals. And they'll have their own kind of private wealth management office that you'd see in a big bank, but they'll have it just for themselves. And so they'll hire smart folks out of banks and hedge funds to manage their own family money. Other times, you can have a multifamily office, which is a pooling together of a lot of other families or individuals of high net worth, and you invest all that money collectively together, and you still have the same team of analysts. You have a CIO who makes the decisions. You typically have a board that makes investment decisions. You have someone who researches other investments, and you get together and you decide on the best path. And I've been lucky to work in a single family office and in a multifamily office. And what that allows me to do is you have billions of dollars at your disposal to invest. Obviously, you have to be very careful that if it's a single family or it's many families, you can get in front of a lot of really good hedge fund managers or private equity ideas, energy ideas. People come to you and they'll take your call because you have money to invest. And the idea, of course, is to manage that family or that group of families' money in a way that gives them a return, but doesn't expose them to those rare but real moments where markets tank and there's a ton of risk. So in simple terms, a family office will invest in a hedge fund quite frequently. They'll invest in many hedge funds and they'll do their, their best to sift the good from the bad from the ugly because there's all of those things in hedge funds. When I hear you explain what a family office is and all the different people that they bring in, the CIO, the general counsel, all the analysts, things like that, it makes yeah. me wonder, and I'm sure the audience is wondering too, what is the general assets under management, if you will, generally for a family office? And I'm sure you have small ones, you have much larger ones, but in general, what are we looking at for a size of one of those? That's a great question. I mean, as you can imagine, they range, but I think if you're going to be paying team of analysts and you're going to be bringing in legal counsel, you're going to be bringing in executives to manage that money and a business, to, you know, a guy to go look or a gal to go look at different hedge funds. You're talking about 15 to 20 people minimum, right? So to be able to pay those salaries year after year and to have the team in place, I think most family offices wouldn't even begin to think of doing that unless they had at least 100 or 200 million to start with. And then, of course, you have, if you bring in many different wealthy families together, you can pool that money. You can be talking about billions of dollars. But I think 
$10 million is a lot of money. I'm not laughing at that. But if you had $10 million, that's probably not enough to start a family office, right? You would then go to a big bank, typically like a Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley, like I said, and they'll, they'll have minimum requirements of five to 10 million. And then, then the bank will be doing that for you. So if you're really extremely high net worth, you can create your own kind of mini private wealth management arm of a bank, call it your family office. And then of course that family office is only as good as the, as the people you hire and bring in to, to manage your wealth. And, and of course the families themselves have, like every family, you have a, a mixture of psychologies and personalities and You've got this, the ones that really care about the money and the other ones who like to spend the money and some, you know, there's always a little soap opera in the families themselves, but typically there's someone who takes command of that family office and ultimately makes the decision. I've worked with really good families and really good people, so I've, I've been really blessed in that regard. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've actually studied family offices a little bit, but I never really looked into what they need to be in, in terms of scale and size before they actually make sense to get started. So it was really interesting. And I'm glad we were able to yep. talk about that. You co-authored a book called Rig to Fail. And I think it's pretty interesting timing to be talking about this type of concept and all of the different material that's in the book. So I want to I start this conversation by talking about how your goal for the book was to inform and prepare Main Street investors for dramatic market risk and opportunities ahead. What is a Main Street investor? And what market risks and opportunities lie ahead for us as Main Street investors? Obviously, a Main Street investor, the very, as the name suggests, kind of, first of all, is someone who doesn't have a family office and a team of analysts and a CIO and a general counsel and the ability of the blessings to, like most of us, to have nine or 10 people researching investments for you and making decisions and researching all that. So, a Main Street investor is like my parents or my friends or who I was before I got into finance, someone who makes their money or makes their living outside of the markets and typically trusts either the headlines of the financial media or, the, or their financial advisor down the street or their 401k manager. A Main Street investor is someone who by their own choices isn't an expert in the markets. And so they either have to become educated themselves if they have an interest or they have to trust somebody else. And so when I wrote Rig to Fail with my colleague, Tom Lott, we wanted to give Main Street investors the benefits of all that we had learned as hedge fund managers or as family office executives or as, in Tom's case, banking executives. He was at World Bank and he was at Morgan Stanley high up there. We wanted to democratize the financial industry so that people like my parents who don't have $100 million or $10 million, uh, like normal people, uh, that they would be getting the same type of straight talk that we would give to a multimillionaire in a, in a board meeting. In other words, we would talk about the same risks and try and make that because the markets are complex, but they don't have to be. I think if you have a little bit of common sense and some basic understandings of how markets work, you don't have to talk down to non professional investors. You can teach them the key things to be looking at in cycles and in asset classes. And we wanted to write a book. I know it has a gloomy title, but we wanted to write a book that warned about risk and at the same time informed readers, you know, what what these family offices and hedge fund guys and banks really do look at and what they're not looking at, what they're not telling you. As insiders, there's a lot we see in the banks and the hedge funds. And we've worked with a lot of banks and in banks uh, and in finance. There's a lot that isn't translated into the headlines or certainly on whether it's the left media or the right media. The mainstream financial media is, is really woefully, recklessly, I think, underserving people by not talking about a lot of the risks that are out there. So this book tries to do that. I think it's quite good at keeping it simple, but also keeping it substantive. We published that book on February 19th of this year, and that was the date of the S&P's all-time high. And so it was very ironic to have a book called Rig to Fail uh, on February 19th. I was like, well, that's a funny title, Matt. Markets are ripping. There's no risk at all. And of course, you know, within two weeks, we were looking at massive losses in the markets. And again, we didn't predict that was going to happen in two weeks, but we did. We definitely saw the risks pre-COVID, and we can talk about that too. But you know, there are massive risks out there, and they really were. I was gonna. They really were there pre-COVID, and and in the book. The theme that really sticks out in the book is debt in a family, debt in a company, debt in a country, debt in any circumstance. If you're, if you're borrowing more than you're taking in, and you're borrowing significantly more than you're taking in, whether you're, 
your husband, husband and wife sitting at the kitchen table talking about, you know, we can't send Junior to private school because we just can't afford it, right? Or we can't get that new car because the debt's too high and the income's not there. Well, what happened even pre-COVID as we were heading into 2020, the debt levels were astronomical. In the global level, the debt in the last 20 years has gone from 80 trillion to 260 trillion. At the US level, it's the same thing. It's tripled. When you look at household debt, government debt, corporate debt, it's at all time record highs. And at the same time that you're looking at this massive debt level, you're seeing no income or very little income. And the way you measure income at a national level is looking at this boring thing called GDP, gross domestic product, but without getting sexy. GDP is basically the national income. And GDP, as debt was tripling, GDP has been flatlined at the same time. So it's just like you're, you have a, a busboy's income and a Ferrari amount of debt right now in the US, in the corporate markets and in the, and in the government market, you know, government debt. It's simply unsustainable to some extent. We could talk about how the Fed can solve that theoretically. But we saw that as a massive red flag, that debt and that GDP. There was massive overvaluation in the stock markets when you look at what the earnings of a stock or a company are based to their price. That's called a price to earnings multiple. They were extremely exaggerated. The other thing that we were seeing is because the central bank has kept interest rates so low for so long since 2008, that when, when the cost of debt is low, and that's where interest rates are, they're the cost of debt. So if the cost of debt is cheap because the Fed has repressed interest rates for so long, companies in particular and governments are going to go on a borrowing binge, like a keg party. They're going to borrow and borrow, and they're going to use that borrowed money to buy back their own stocks or give dividends. And that distorts confidence. It makes people think the markets are healthier than they really are, but they're really debt-driven. I always joke that if I gave my son my Amex card, even though he doesn't make a dime and he's in college and he's running around campus buying kegs and buying, you know, renting out hotel rooms for the weekend and renting a Ferrari to go down to South Beach, he's going to look really sexy and really successful, but it's all credit card. It's all debt. And in a lot of ways, a lot of publicly traded companies, which I would call zombies because they're just debt soaked and not producing revenues or earnings, are getting away with that facade of looking successful. And frankly, our own government does the same thing. They have tremendous amounts of debt and very little income, but they have a central bank that can print money out of thin air to buy that debt. The fancy lads call that debt monetization, but it's really faking it. It's like, Robert, if you published a book and you were a bestseller because you sold X amount of copies, you say, hey, I'm Robert Leonard, I have a bestseller. But you didn't tell everybody that you have a rich uncle back in Ohio who bought all those books and put them in the garage. So technically, yes, you're a bestseller, but really, you have a rich uncle who kind of fudged the numbers. And in a lot of ways, that fudging of the numbers is what we're seeing systemically at the corporate level and at the government level. So I call it faking it, but it does create an image of success or an image of sustainability. And in the book, Rigged to Fail, we tried to show without drama, but with math and common sense that this market is completely fake market. And yet, course, it's going up right now, but it's driven by things that aren't sustainable. And there's a great ec economist that I came across years ago named von Mies. He's a, the Austrian school of economics. And his central thesis is whenever you have a debt binge, the recession that follows is always equal or greater to the amount of debt that created that um, binge. And so what we've seen since 2008 is a record-breaking debt binge. And by simple math and algorithms, we're going to see a record-breaking recession at some point. And we can talk about timing that, which is difficult. But to me, it's a question of math and history and looking at the right data that those debt levels are not sustainable and the market is not sustainable longer term. And to us, it's just a question simply of debt. That, that has us very concerned, very concerned. We're going to dive into the expected recession that you've been talking about. But before we do, if the US government or the Fed can print money, essentially mm -hmm. unlimited, right? In theory, right. why does it stop? When do we reach a point where something happens? What is that thing that's going to happen that's just going to say, all right, we can't continue to print money? Like, What, what is going to happen? That is the, the most important question. It's probably the most, whether you're a, a super sophisticated investor or just a guy on the street, that is the question. And there's a lot of different answers. I think at the broadest level, and we'll start at 30,000 feet and then get down to the details, but that is a great question, Robert. And I think at the broadest level, that tug of war between printing money and faking it and debt, and then the uh-oh moment where we have a recession, 
what that tug of war between the fundamentals, and I'm talking massive unemployment, low GDP, low growth, overvalued bond markets, overvalued stock markets, grossly overvalued, that tug of war between those facts and then a rising stock market does come to an end. And I think it comes to an end at a broad level when faith in that system collapses. And that can, that's very hard to time, a loss of faith, right? It's like in a relationship, when you suddenly just slowly just lose interest in that person, there's something not there and it slowly starts to die. It's the same thing with our currencies and our markets. Right now, there's a tremendous amount of faith in the central bank and Powell and before him, Yellen and before him, her Bernanke and before Bernanke, Greenspan. There was this sense that these all-powerful Fed PhDs from Ivy League schools really could, could have your back and knew what they were doing and they were gonna, they're going to keep us from going into a recession. Of course, they've been wrong every time, but there's a faith that the experts will, will keep us safe. And I think that faith is slowly starting to erode now. So at 30,000 feet, I think it's a matter of faith. The other thing, of course, there is no limit to how much a central bank, you know, I'm in Europe right now, I'm in France, there's the ECB, the European Central Bank is very much like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, the Bank of England, all these central banks do the same thing. And all of them technically can print unlimited amounts of their local currency. We can print $5 trillion this year, we could print $5 trillion next year. But what happens when you do that? You know, you would know, and I would know, and I think even Jay Powell knows, common sense says that's if it seems too good to be true, it is too good to be true. You can't solve a fundamental growth problem or debt problem with more debt or printing money literally out of thin air. And, and that's what we've been doing for over a decade now. And of course, that can continue. There's a lot of ways that can continue. I can explain that. But if you imagine a glass of scotch, a good glass of scotch, you know, and, and it's a cold winter night, and you've been wanting to drink that scotch all day, and you sit down by the fireplace and you drink that scotch. But if you add buckets of water to that scotch, the scotch flavor is going to go away. You're going to dilute the scotch. And when you think about the, the trillions of dollars we've printed just in the last six weeks and the trillions of dollars we printed from 2009 to 2014, that has a massive dilution effect on our currency. It doesn't mean inflation or hyperinflation. That's complicated. It doesn't mean that we have hyperinflation yet, but it does mean that the purchasing power of your dollar or your yen or your euro or your peso is going to be highly diluted. So like a Big Mac that cost 60 cents in 1970 costs about $5.50 in 2020 for a reason. The, the power of your currency has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker because we have literally created so much of that currency out of thin air that the purchasing power is there. And I think that does eventually lead to some form of inflation. And I think as people start to see that, that's a problem. The other problem is really technically, it's like that book. If you write a book and your rich uncle buys every copy of that book, you will be a bestseller and you will have sold a lot of books. And technically, the Fed can print money to buy assets. Right now, it's buying junk bonds and corporate CMBS bonds. So it's literally faking it. The Fed is directly purchasing assets. And very soon, they'll probably start purchasing stocks too to keep the market going. But the market isn't the real economy. And that's the big sin of Wall Street and the central banks. And I've written about that. They're totally in collusion together. The Fed doesn't have Main Street as its focus. Jay Powell was on 60 Minutes. That was nonsense. The Fed's number one mistress is Wall Street. And it's always been that way. And I write about that and I show that. But what the Fed can do is they can keep the stock market going by printing money and diluting the currency. But the Main Street economy, the one you're seeing in frustration right now across the country, the wealth disparity in America right now is the highest it's been in its history. And no matter how much the stock market goes up, the vast majority of Americans aren't in the stock market. Or to the extent that they are, it's a very small amount relative to the top 10%. And so when you have Main Street suffering and everything you buy at a Walmart is effectively was made in China, and you can blame China. China has a lot of reasons to blame, and believe me. But when you guys, when you got executives at Apple or at Nike exporting 90% of the jobs for their American products overseas, that means Americans aren't getting those jobs. Our manufacturing, our GDP is getting weaker. We've shot ourselves in the foot. But the Main Street economy is up to its ears in credit card debt, student loan debt. I think the numbers are astounding. I mean, the vast majority of Americans don't have $1,000 in their checking account. And that's not laughing at them. I understand that. I come from a small town in the Midwest. Most people don't have a lot of money and they have a lot of debt. And so you can have a ripping stock market, but the Fed can't prevent and they're not preventing 
the crisis on Main Street. So I think the next crisis may not be a stock market crash, although I do think it will crash significantly. The real crisis is already happening. And it was happening before COVID and it was happening before the race riots. The real crisis is Main Street America. The middle class America is quantifiably, mathematically dissipating day by day. These people are struggling. Again, these are the people I grew up with and Tom grew up with in Pennsylvania. Yeah, we went to nice schools and we worked on Wall Street in the south of France, but we haven't forgotten. And I don't mean this in Polynesia way. We definitely have not forgotten the real America. And I think our Federal Reserve has. It's not even a political thing, red or blue or polka dotted, whether it's Obama, Trump. We don't get into the politics, but the truth is, Democrat or Republican, Wall Street has walked right past Main Street. The Fed has walked right over Main Street. And I think what we're seeing is a really fragile stock market for a number of debt driven reasons. But even more importantly, we're seeing an ignored Main Street. And the recession could come from the bottom up, which happens frequently in history. And it's, it's, it's kind of our, our own policy fault for years of binging on debt. It's quite sad. I just want to say for everyone listening to the show today that the questions that Matt and I are discussing, the different topics that we're talking about, we don't necessarily have the exact answers. What he's saying is what he thinks is going to happen. What I'm talking about is what I think might happen. No one really knows. And if anybody says they do, then you should probably run the other way. But I just want to put that out there because we are putting out our, our best opinion and what we really think is going to happen. But again, we don't know. And when you have somebody like Matt on the show who's as smart as he is with all this experience that he has, we want to hear what someone like him thinks. So that's, I just want to put that out there that I am asking tough questions of him. So we may or may not have the right answers. But Matt, you, you talked about the book example, and that makes me think of a, a similar type situation. And so I've been considering potentially writing my own book. And so I had been doing a lot of research on it. And there's this quote unquote hack, if you will, on Amazon that there are thousands and thousands of subcategories. And what you can do is you can publish your book in a subcategory. And because mm-hmm. nobody else publishes there, if you sell just a couple books, you instantly become a quote unquote Amazon bestseller. And so that was the example I thought of when you were talking about that. And right. it makes me think about what's going on with the market is it went way down, everybody, and then the Fed mm-hmm. comes in and buys it all up. But it's really just a trick that is bringing up the stock market. So do you think this is going to be potentially one of the last times that the Fed can come in and do what they did to prop up the stock market? Or do you think it can happen again? I think it can happen again. I think there are many people who know me will probably be laughing as they listen to this because I was pretty, I was pretty fed up with the Fed by 2016, 2017. I thought, this just can't continue. This is crazy, right? And of course, every time you thought it was going to be over, the Fed... I mean, 2018, I, I called a crash just because, again, I won't get into the details. I saw the bond market. I saw rates rising because of central bank quantitative and right, raising rates. I knew that that was going to be too much of a rate hike for the bond and stock markets. And that was kicking in in October of 2018. And by Christmas Eve of 2018, the markets were crashing. And people thought, is this the end? I said, no, because the Fed will come back in and print more money. And they did. Throughout 2019, QE came back. They started printing money. They didn't call it QE, but they did start printing money. And more importantly, they reduced interest rates. And that's just more kegs at the keg party. And so I said, look, risk on. If the Fed's going to reduce rates, that crisis we saw at Christmas and New Year's of 2018-19 was immediately resolved. And then again, this, this year when you saw COVID certainly was the trigger, but the illness in the market was here long before COVID. And the lockdown policies made COVID economically at least, far worse than the actual crisis itself. But you saw a 33% drop in the S&P in March. And people thought, well, this is it. This is it. And I said, no, if anything, COVID saved the markets because the Fed in a matter of weeks printed more money in a matter of weeks than they have done in the last many years. And so it's like a Lance Armstrong market. Look, if you give Lance Armstrong steroids, he's going to win, right? He's going to win, he's going to win, he's going to win until eventually he ends in disgrace and has to give back all his yellow jerseys. And I think, you know, when you hear me talking gloomily about the markets, I'm not saying the markets are going to crash this year. In fact, it's ironic that despite this massive disconnect between fundamentals and economic indicators and in the rallying stock market, if the Fed wants to continue to monetize debt and print trillions of dollars, they can buy us another year, another month, another quarter. I don't know. And they can put a cap on interest rates. They can manage the yield curve. In other words, they can do a lot of tricks still. But all they're doing is keeping a Frankenstein alive. They're not going to get economic growth by adding more 
zeros to the balance sheet, printing more money or taking on more debt, it's simply mathematically and historically not possible. You have to get growth back in this economy. And you know, even if we had 40% GDP every year, we're not going to get past the debt we're already in. I think of a, a cartoon character like you know, Wile E. Coyote when he goes past the cliff and he's hanging there for a few seconds, doesn't realize he's about to crash. We've already passed that cliff, that Rubicon of debt. We are going to have a day of reckoning, but I can't tell you it's going to be next quarter or next year because you don't want to fight the Fed. It's very powerful. I've stopped trying to predict when the Fed's expiration date will come. It gets closer every year. But you know, even JP Morgan is predicting a year-on-year negative 30% GDP for the next quarter. And look, when GDP falls by 30%, you can't have a bull market. It's just absolutely insane. That's like literally trying to be, it's like me trying to pitch for the Yankees in my, you know, 50 years old. My fastball isn't what it was in high school, but even if it was, I could never pitch for the Yankees. And the Fed cannot create a bull market when GDP is going down 30, 20, 40% next quarter. I know companies on the NASDAQ right now that have billions of dollars of debt, literally no revenues, no income. Their debt is going to be due in the next couple months, and yet their stock price is up 20, 30% this week. I mean, that is absolutely unsustainable. But to say I'm going to time exactly when that ends is really no one who times the market is right. Usually, the things you don't see coming. But I always say if you and I go to the beach, we can bring an umbrella or we can, we can bring sunblock. I'm not a meteorologist, I'm not a weather expert, but you and I can look at the horizon. If there's dark clouds coming over the the waves, we'll break out the umbrella. If the sun's out, we'll break out the sunblock. And I think if you know what signals to look at in the market at a macro level and at a micro level, you can you can either take on risk or you can get out of the way of risk. It's fairly obvious once you know what things to look at. And I, I think the media doesn't tell you about these risks. Guys like Jim Cramer and that. I mean they're they're all just positive all the time because markets are up 70% of the time. But the problem is when you have a 40, 50% correction or 30% correction and you're in your 70s or your 60s and you're retired, if you, if you lose 40 or 50%, you have to get 80 or 90% returns just to get back to where you started. You have to remember that. You have to avoid those losses. And of course, no one can time the exact moment of a loss, but you actually, if you have the right tools, can get pretty damn close. And I think it's, it's a very simple mantra. You don't need to go to Wharton or Harvard Business School or you know, all that. Your grandfather, your dad, everyone tells us this, buy low and sell high. But nobody does it. Like right now, you're seeing this crazy stampede to get into a market 70% higher than it was at the height of 2008 before it crashed. People are very predictable. They, they have a fear of missing out. They're on the golf course. Their friends are making money. They, they pile in at the worst time. They get suckered in because look, you wouldn't normally pay $1,000 for a Snickers bar unless you could find a greater fool to pay $1,200 for it tomorrow. As of right now, that's what's driving people to go into this market. But you are literally buying at the worst time, even if there's 20% more to go up. The smart money, and then certainly in the old family monies, the families that I work with, they wait for a bottom. They'll wait and wait and wait because every market does bottom. Whether it's 10 years from now or 10 minutes from now, it will bottom. And if you're young, if you're you know, under 40, I tell my own daughter who's at Goldman Sachs, you know, don't join the Goldman Sachs 401k program. Just wait. Wait for this market to tank and buy at the bottom. You're 24 years old. You're going to have a huge opportunity to buy at a bottom, whether it's this year or next year. And that's where the real money is always made, at the bottom. You know, and if you're super smart, maybe you can short this market. But right now, you can't short this market because the Fed is pumping so much steroids that you can't bet against the market until it's a real, real obvious trend. So it's it's a very difficult market to understand. And rather than get into sexy hedge fund strategies or short strategies, I tell I tell retail Main Street investors, look, if you're older, you got to get out of the way, avoid the risk, get out at the top. All of our investors were spared all of the, the, the March disasters. So they're, we've been up all year, but it's not because we're smart. We just saw the storm clouds coming. We didn't know if it was going to be March 1st or March 7th, but we knew it was coming. So we just got out of the way. And by simply avoiding losses, you make a lot of money. And by waiting for a real market correction, a 50, 60% correction, we'll get back in. We'll buy low. It's that simple. But most people do the exact opposite. They buy high. They get crushed like they did in 2008 or 2000, and then they don't have enough money to get back in when the market bottoms because they bled out at that point. And it's understandable. It's sad, but it happens over and over. 
it doesn't always happen to the, the, the best represented families who have the best advice. And I think the rig to fail was designed to teach people without being dramatic. Look, you can see the signals yourself, make your own choices, but this market is full of risk. You've got to prepare for it. We often hear that we should not be timing the market. And I hear you saying, wait to buy at the bottom. Why is that not considered timing the market? Again, no one ever can time the top or the bottom. No one, even Benjamin Graham, who was a great value investor in the 30s, he thought he was going to buy at the bottom and the market kept going down. This guy really was smart. You know, he's smarter than I am and he couldn't time the bottom. I certainly can't time when this market's going to crash precisely and when it's going to hit its all time high and when it's going to hit its all time bottom. I think the best you can do is approximate. It's reversion to the mean. Markets tend to revert to their means and bottoms. You're never going to time it right. But again, it's, it's like that famous Supreme Court justice says, I don't know the legal definition of pornography. I just know it when I see it, right? You won't always know the top or the bottom. You look at a chart of the S&P right now compared to the dot-com bubble, which I came into, or the S&P bubble of 2008, and then you look at the current bubble, it's infinitely higher than the dot-com or the 2008 bubble. So we're clearly at a top. We may not at the top, but it's enough to know that you shouldn't be all in at a top. That's where you start taking some cash. You start taking some profits. And if the market goes down 40 or 50%, that's not maybe the bottom, but that's a good time to start getting money in. And by the way, with, with the right signals, there's always a trade, long or short. And we try to look at market signals more than just tops and bottoms. But I, first of all, I do agree with you. Market timing, market predicting is absurd. But I think preparation, being prepared with a little common sense, that anyone can do. And I think anyone who really stares at the market and studies it for a little bit of time, the time it takes to watch an NFL game, read a little bit, you can tell yourself, honestly, that there's too much risk to be all in, or there's a good opportunity. I think a lot of people are looking for that one new Amazon or Netflix stock at the bottom that they're going to make millions off of. It's very rarely going to happen. The real way to make money is slow and steady, and the real way is to avoid a 40-50% loss, which you know they don't happen often, but they happen often enough to take away all your gains. If you just look at 2020, again, it's just right now as a current example, everyone's so excited about the recovery now, this raging market. But again, the market's lost 33% in March. So if you look at this rally we've had in April and May, the truth is, net net, the S and P's only up about three percent, depending on when you look at it. You haven't made much money this year, and yet, you know, you had to go through a lot of volatility in March, a lot of sleepless nights if you were just riding it out. And I'm saying you can avoid a lot of that volatility by looking at certain signals. But of course, not myself or anyone is going to be able to tell you this is the top, this is when the bottom, and this is when it's going to come. You know, no one knows. You really don't. But you can tell again if it's going to rain or it's going to going to be sunny just by looking at the horizon. We do our best to try and be as honest and blunt as we can about that horizon, whether it's sunny or rainy. And right now, based on everything we look at, other than the Federal Reserve, the, the weather is very, very cloudy. But I do not underestimate the Fed. I think the Fed could buy us years more time before the markets crash. I think the economy is already in a recession based on pure economic terms. But the stock market and in many ways can continue to go. And I think one of the reasons the Fed is so desperate to keep the stock market up is in a lot of ways, because so many pension funds are in the, in the stock market and so much retirement accounts and so much of the US economy is based on the stock market. There's so much at stake that it's almost nationalizing the S&P when you're going to start buying stocks, they're buying junk bonds, they're buying corporate bonds. They need to do that to keep rates down. But they'll start buying stocks too, like the Japanese did after the Nikkei crash in 89. And I think they'll do that because, in a sense, the stock market's become one big US 401k. There's a vested interest in keeping that thing somewhat above water. And that's just an opinion. But again, I think the Fed can continue to use this stimulus to keep markets up. It's like if, you know, in college, you don't want to have a hangover. So you just keep one more Bloody Mary going, one more Bloody Mary going, keep the Bloody Marys going. You don't want the hangover. But as anyone knows, whether you're in college or you're having a martini, if you have 12 martinis, Fed has done a great job of postponing that hangover. But that's not necessarily the best honest approach. Even capitalism requires a recession. You need it to reset prices. You need it to reset expectations. Otherwise, you create a massive moral hazard of rewarding bad companies for bad behavior by giving them bailouts or cheap loans or cheap debt or printed money. And I don't think that's the best message. But I think we've become so used to the good times 
as a culture and as an economy that we're going to be very caught off guard whenever and however this market crashes. But I think the the recession on Main Street, I mean, just walk through Michigan or Ohio or, you know, get away from, you know, Malibu Beach or Manhattan or Park Avenue or the south of France or Palm Beach and go into the real America. And people are already suffering. They don't need me or a Wall Street Journal article to tell them there's a recession coming. They feel it every day. And they have to, I think there's 480 million credit cards in circulation right now. I think there's massive amounts of American families. I think there's three credit cards for every American adult because they're just surviving off credit cards. And I'm not laughing at them. I get it. They can't make ends meet. The cost of living is high. Wages have not raised in years and debt is off the charts. So the real America is suffering. Students are coming out of school with grotesque amounts of debt. It's, it's appalling, in my opinion. It's criminal. And you know, like I said, the average American doesn't have $1,000. I think the, the percentage I read recently was 40% of Americans could not survive a $400 emergency without having to sell something. And I think, you know, without trying to exaggerate that, that's, that's not right for America. And again, those are not the clients I tend to see in hedge funds and family offices, but I, how I didn't want to forget them because that's where we came from. You know, and it's not to be Pollyannish, but you can't forget that. And it's not even good for our country to have that kind of wealth disparity. But I don't think there's any way we can get around the recession to come in terms of just Main Street economics. The stock market, yes, that can still have some juice based on central bank stimulus. And you don't want to you don't want to fight the Fed. But as Tom always says, trust but verify. We don't fight the Fed. We just don't fully trust it. That's a long, long answer, kind of a over the top, but it really does astound me. And I think. Um, you know, if you just take a look at some of the data, you'll see for yourself, you can verify this stuff without being dramatic. So if we think that maybe a 30, 40, 50% downturn might be a, a buying opportunity, why wasn't this drop of that magnitude? We saw some things drop 30, 40, 50, even 60 or 70%. Why wasn't that considered a buying opportunity? Or was it? It was in some ways. I mean, we, uh, we certainly bought at the bottoms a little bit, but that wasn't our bottom yet. It wasn't our big bottom. But first of all, one thing to keep in mind, when you look at the S&P, for example, which is, or the Dow, but the S&P, the majority of the performance of the S&P in this rally has come from five stocks. And you probably know what they are. Bangs, the Facebook, the Amazon, the Netflix, the Google. I mean, those are highly concentrated tech stocks. Great story. I love it. But the truth is the fangs are not the US economy and the fangs are not the stock market, but they generate most of the returns in this market. And I remember in the dot-com bubble, you know, there were stocks like Cisco and Microsoft and Yahoo and Juniper. They were, you know, they were the, the golden, golden boys of that era. And Microsoft, of course. Now, each of those stocks went down 50 or 60%. That doesn't mean that I think Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google are going to disappear. I'm just saying they're grossly overvalued, including Amazon, even in this COVID environment. They're grossly overvalued. And so I just do, I just wait for those stocks to go down in price because I think they're overvalued. But I think the 30% correction slash drawdown crash that we saw in March is just the first tremor. I think there's going to be much more quakes to come. But I think the Fed knows that too. And they are literally pulling out all their guns. And so, like I said, you don't fight the Fed. We didn't fight the Fed, but we just didn't sucker ourselves fully into it. We were 50% in cash by February. So and even at 50% in cash, we completely are outperforming the stock market right now by picking the right sectors. That's just maybe luck, maybe some skill. But wasn't, what was not lucky, what was skill, was we did see a major crash coming in March, and we just got out of its way. And by doing that, we managed risk. And again, this is something anyone, I think, can do if they have the right signals in front of them. It's not rocket science. It's just common sense with a little bit of help with the right signals. Most financial advisors don't talk about risk. They don't talk about these signals. But it's just about the risk today so outweighs the reward. The risk reward metrics are so asymmetric that even if you can't time it, you can recognize a top, not the top, and you can recognize a bottom, not the bottom with some basic common sense. And if you have the patience and the discipline and not a fear of missing out or keeping up with your neighbors and can just manage risk, because one thing I've seen over and over, and this was in, in a multifamily office that I was with, I had a really brilliant mentor and uh, you know the family patriarch. And he kept really brilliant guy, made his money in prime brokerage, made lots and lots of money. Good guy, 
but his he kept pounding the fit the the desk return 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 that was his mantra we need to get return we need to get return performance and i would say no we need to think risk 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 but there was always this tug of war the real way to make money is to manage risk intelligently not hide in the corner and hug your knees but to manage risk intelligently i think is is kind of an art and a science and sometimes you can be too afraid and i'm guilty of that sometimes i think the risk is just too crazy so i miss out on things i'll very guilty of that I'm astounded by the fact we've gone 12 years without a 50, 60% correction. But I'm also not surprised because I think the Fed is, and other central banks in the world are really in full overdrive right now. And you don't want to fight that Fed. You really don't. All right, guys. So that wraps up part one of Matthew and I's conversation. Like I said in the intro, this will be a two-part series, and we will pick up in next week's episode right where we left off today for part two. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.